Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hi, Adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode of America Adapts. In this episode, I'm talking with Josh Dorfman, the CEO of The Collider. The Collider is a nonprofit organization working with individuals and startup companies. They mainly work with groups focusing on big data tools, but they are also developing a climate ecosystem, fostering a network of like-minded climate practitioners. You have to listen to understand what unique niche they're filling. Josh is a great storyteller, and I think you'll find the journey of The Collider fascinating yet another sign of the rapidly emerging field of adaptation. Okay, some brief housekeeping. First off, America Daps is celebrating two years as a podcast. You caught this in the previous episode, and a special shout out to Sean Martin of World Wildlife Fund for guest hosting the episode. Sean, you did a great job. I've mentioned before, you can now listen to the podcast on Alexa. In my show notes, there's a YouTube video that shows you how to do this. Also, you can now listen to the podcast on Google's new podcast app, Google Podcasts. And as always, you can listen on Spotify. Upcoming episodes, I am doing a three-part flood-themed series with World Wildlife Fund. I know I've been talking about this for a while, and I'm still working on it with WWF. I'm talking with a who's who of flooding and adaptation experts. Very excited when we get that first episode out. And I'm also getting an Olympic snowboarding medalist, Ariel Gold. And she's coming on, and we're going to talk about an organization she's helping protect our winters, which is obviously talking about how climate change is impacting the winter games. Also, I'm finishing an episode about adaptation in Queensland, Australia. Great stuff ahead. Occasionally, I do shout-outs on the podcast. I want to do a shout-out to Julia N., To respect her privacy, I don't want to reveal Julia's last name. I hear from listeners all the time, but I just want to thank Julia for her special message where she shared what the podcast means to her. Julia is a self-described young adaptation professional looking to find her niche in this emerging field. You made my day, Julia, and I hope I can continue producing episodes that are useful and inspiring to you in the months and years ahead. Okay, just a reminder, America Daps is a charitable organization that needs your support please consider giving a tax-deductible donation. You can find links on the We Didn't Donate page in the show notes. So there, you're looking at your phone. Look down at the show notes. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring a specific podcast, having me go on location, or having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. I share stories from the podcast and my own experiences in adaptation. You can contact me via the website americaadapts.org. Okay, adapters, let's join in with Josh Dorfman of the collider hey welcome back adapters on today's episode i am very excited to be hosting josh dorfman josh is the ceo of the collider a global innovation center for climate entrepreneurs hi josh welcome to the podcast hey doug great to be here so you're relatively new to the collider right how long have you been there that's correct i came in as ceo on may 1st so we're coming up on a few months now. So could you briefly describe the history of the Collider? It's sort of a unique idea. I've been digging around on it, and I, I sort of touched base with you guys last year, but it, it's a unique thing that you got going there. Sure. So we're based in Asheville, North Carolina, for a couple of highly strategic reasons, the, the biggest one being that NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, or NCEI, is headquartered here, and basically that's NOAA's data division. So that means that Asheville is home to the largest archive of climate and weather data in the world and the vast intellectual capital in terms of climate scientists, big data experts and, and scientists who, who manage that data and make it accessible to the world. So when we started looking at that asset, I should say when Asheville started looking at that asset and some of our leaders on city council and some of kind of the elders of Asheville who think about the future, and this was about seven or, seven or eight years ago, there was a feeling of, hey, if the, as the climate, we know climate's changing, we know climate change is something that the world is going to have to increasingly deal with. Could that data be an economic engine, an innovation engine for our city? Could we figure out ways to help business society understand their exposure to climate change and take plans to react accordingly to be, to adapt and become resilient? And that effort really started to 
sort of formalize and, and, and take root about two years ago with the launch of the Collider. And so we are located in a 25,000 square foot space in downtown Asheville. If you've ever been to Asheville or folks have ever been to Asheville, this is a very cool town. It kind of has a, has a cool college vibe. It's based in the mountains of, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And we are sort of like this class A office space that looks like aliens came down, <laughs> landed in Asheville, and built something like really awesome that kind of doesn't look like the rest of our city. Here at the Collider, when it, when it started two years ago, we said, okay, we have the data. Let's start thinking about how do we catalyze market-based solutions to climate change that's going to harness that data. Uh, when I came in a few months ago, and the playbook that we're now rolling out is is thinking about how do we build climate data startups? How do we help grow tech entrepreneurship around that data? Again, to kind of do what I'm talking about, to think through, all right, how can we build data analytics models? How can we do, uh, build predictive tools that can kind of run the gamut of issues that humanity is going to face as the climate continues to change to help and, and facilitate in that process? That could be cities figuring out, okay, is, you know, if they're on, um, that are dealing with flood or rising sea level, Where's that water going to go? How do we deal with that? How do we plan accordingly? It could be corporations that increasingly have to report out to public markets on their climate risk. That's something that the, the public, you know, the financial markets are asking for. You know, how do we do that? How do we understand what the risk is? How do we report on it? And how do we take ash, action to, to mitigate it? Or it could be things like public health where climate data in a changing climate can be really informative to understand you know, what's your asthma risk today or what's your allergy risk today? Because it's different today than it was 20 years ago as the climate changes and that's going to continue to change. We focus on helping startups and entrepreneurs who are tackling those kinds of challenges. Okay. And I'm going to dig into that whole process in a little bit, but just, I guess a bit more of that history, the name collider, I, when the first things come to my mind is the Hadron super collider. Is there sort of, is that the kind of concept behind what you're trying to accomplish? Well, I would say that may have been an inspiration. I think the the collider comes from the concept of, you know, here in Asheville, so we, we have NOAA, we have the federal government here. We have two really important centers, uh, uh, academic centers of excellence here, one from NC State called the North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies, or NCICS, and one from UNC Asheville called the National Environmental Modeling and Analysis Center, or NEMAC. So you've got government here, you've got academia here, we bring corporations here. In fact, we have some corporations that are members. And then we bring entrepreneurs into the mix and we start saying, let's create a bunch of collisions here. Let's create synergy. Let's get people into the same rooms who are talk starting to talk about the same kinds of issues and problems. And let's see if we can drive innovative processes to come up with solutions. So the collider really is about creating those highly strategic co collisions, um, relationships and networks that can hopefully yield solutions. All right. I like that name. It's a great name. So you are in Asheville. I've been in Asheville a couple of times. I actually was there last year during the, the eclipse. It's a great town. And when I think of Asheville, I think of craft beer in the Appalachian Mountains. And so you mentioned that this NOAA facility is there. And so I guess literally, is there a lot of in between, I guess, your facility and you know, scientists that are coming into that facility or are working there? I mean, how are you really taking advantage of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we do it in a number in a number of ways. Uh, every month, we are hosting NOAA and climate scientists. That they come in here and they give a briefing on, you know, it's their monthly briefing on what's happened over over the last thirty days around the globe. Uh, trends they're seeing, you know, if there's major impacts, those get highlighted. So they run that here. We also run something every month called the Chatmosphere, which is really interesting, where we bring in climate scientists from the federal building, and one of them presents on a topic of, of interest. And, you know, it, it could be, you know, everything from, well, let's compare why did NOAA say last year was, you know, maybe the third hottest year on record or whatever, and NASA said something else, like what is that, why is there that minute difference What's behind it? Let's break that down. And, and we get into some really interesting conversations with people who are actually putting out those reports and on the front lines of the data. Or they could be saying, hey, you know, let's look at Hurricane Harvey. What just happened in Houston? You know, a storm that wasn't, you know, the, a once in a thousand year storm. 
But now we're running predictive models, and that could be a storm. We think by the end of the century that maybe is a one in six year storm. So how are we going to deal with that? And we have an we have an intellectual conversation there, and we're constantly bringing entrepreneurs into those conversations too. Uh, we're moving to a place as we've we've just rolled out a mentor program where we'll have climate scientists holding office hours, big data experts holding office hours. So as entrepreneurs are increasingly building models that rely on the data. They're going to have, you know, kind of firsthand primary access to those who can help them. What I think is really cool is that you, I guess you're trying to create sort of a, a community there in Asheville around this. And it's just not, I guess it's not all work, but there's a sort of social dynamic of like, all right, let's have these conversations. And you've only been around for two years, but it, are you sort of, it, what are, I guess, what are the challenges are kind of getting people to, I guess, to participate in that community? There's a number of things that we think about. One, as you alluded to, this is a, it's a beautiful place. We talk about Asheville. It's, it's definitely a tourist town. We have a thriving craft beer scene, a thriving food, uh, you know, a thriving food scene. It, there's a very high quality of life. The, the general population of Asheville has very little idea that NOAA has such a significant presence in our town. And so, we now are running a, a number of events on a regular cadence to bring the general population into the collider, to actually understand the assets that are here, to understand our vision for what we're trying to do. You know, as so we're trying to turn Asheville into a global hub for climate tech entrepreneurship and really have this be a place that's advancing humanity's ability to adapt and thrive in a changing climate, we're trying to build recognition of the assets that are here so people in Asheville can take pride and ownership in that and recognize that that we are much more than awesome beer, which is awesome. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, and great food and awesome mountain biking. But there's really some important work being done here on, on a very big scale. So, you know, so that's that's a challenge just locally. And, and so, for example, next month, we're going to run a Collider Discovery Day where five of our startups will be on stage talking about it, it's not a it's not an investment pitch. It's just really a, a business presentation to say, here's how we are using this data and these assets to help our stakeholders, our constituents with their adaptation planning, their risk modeling, um, so they can take, you know, put resilience plans in place and take action. You know, again, that could be cities, that could be national governments, that could be individuals, but we really want to bring the data to life. And so that Ashvillians can say, wow, this is really awesome. And, and by that pride of ownership in it, you know, they talk about it more and the collider and the brand and, and the whole mission gets elevated uh, locally. Well, I, I have a friend who lives in Asheville when I was visiting her. She told me about you guys and I'd been sort of talking. I'm moving out of DC and she suggested move to Asheville and you can, I guess you can rent space at your facility. And I guess the whole point is creating again that community of climate related folks. And so I briefly flirted with the idea, but it, you guys were just a bit too cold <laughs> for my liking, but it, I love the idea. I love the concept. Oh man, you would love it here. You would be like, you would be among your people. <laughs> uh, you know, we also, this was right before I came in uh, to, to join the Collider in March. We ran what we call our Business of Climate Forum. Uh, we're going to do it again next April 2019. And, you know, so this was a conference where we had major corporations represented, you know, Levi's talking about reputation branding in the age of climate change, you know, Aon talking about how does the, what's the, the insurance company lens on, on, on a changing climate right now, IBM and the weather company talking about how they're using data, you know, everything in between. We had NOAA scientists on stage. Like I said, we had academics here. We had leaders from various cities. And the thing about the collider, and I do think this is Asheville too, you know, our culture, is very open, very welcoming, uh, open to uh, you know, open to new ideas. I mean, there's there's a hippie culture here, there's a progressive culture here. The startup culture feels unique in that it really is kind of a pay it forward culture, and it creates a vibe where people are willing to kind of come off their talking points a little bit and really have some you know kind of I guess I would say more real conversation about what it's like to to be, you know, in, in varying roles that people play kind of on the front lines of dealing with these really big issues. No, I agree. And the, the atmosphere there, I think you, you guys have probably been discovered for 10 years now, but it's only you're probably going to attract more people. You have such <laughs> resources there, all that public land there. My friend would take me up looking for hellbender salamanders in, in the Appalachians. And so it's just really cool area. All right. I want to dig a bit more into what you guys do. So 
there, so what you just described, there's all these sort of different services, but I guess as you help these startups, you know, there's things like workshops. And I just, could you sort of take me through this process and just uh, let me like, frame this a little bit more. And I'm sort of visualizing like an individual has an idea and do they approach you or is it an existing company? And are you there really nurturing a concept from just someone's brainstorm? And yeah, it, I bet there's a spectrum there, but if you could sort of just, you know, walk, walk us through like really how, what's the handholding process in, in what you do? Okay. Happy to. So keep in mind that we're three months into to implementation here of this strategy. So some components we've rolled out, some are going to be rolling out over the next six months, but here's the playbook that we're, we're putting into place right now. And so if a, let's say a climate scientist shows up who's like, man, I've been thinking about this idea for a while and I think this really could be a business or it's a, a person with a really strong tech background who says, gosh, I see a problem in the world. I can code, but I don't really know a lot about the data. You know, folks could be coming in from kind of different points of view. Our process is we say, look, this starts with a startup boot camp and a startup boot camp is a 10 week program that we're getting ready to launch most likely in January of 2019, probably four or five months away. We're working on it now where we would run a, an entrepreneur or a potential entrepreneur through a 10 week program to help them hopefully come out the other end with a validated idea. So it's not a full business plan, but we would run through things like, okay, you know, we're going to help you understand, does your idea actually solve a customer's pain? How would you know? What data would you use if you were going to be working on this? Who would be the early customers who might buy it? How would you price it? Who are you going to go talk to? How are you going to communicate it? You know, what would be your marketing and sales strategy? What would be your financial model? What value do you really think you create? You know, these types of things. And can we put a, can we really put a financial picture against that idea so that after 10 weeks, that person with the idea can kind of get to a point where they, where they could have a sort of no, a go, no go moment, right? Okay. The idea is validated. This is a business. I'm going to pursue it. At that point, we would say, great. We have co-working space here. We have small offices, but why don't you come in, start co-working here when, and co-working is one where you become a member of the collider. And as a member of the collider, you get access to a couple of things, actually several things. We just, we're rolling out now our mentor program. So, we have folks coming in who just started in July. We're going to scale it up over the next you know, six to 12 months where an entrepreneur now comes in. They have their idea. They get to meet every month with startup executives who really get operations, with people who have founded companies before, venture capitalists, um, and also on the climate side with climate scientists big data experts connected to the data, all sorts of experts who can help guide them as they're trying to now build on this idea. Plus, you know, a number of mentors that everybody needs to meet with, whether it's legal, finance, accounting, because, you know, every business has to check a whole bunch of the same boxes. All of that we provide. In addition, every Tuesday and Thursday, we're, we're providing what you alluded to, Doug, these skills-based workshops. Now, that could be, again, some general business topics like you know, what do you need to know about labor laws? If you're going to hire someone and put them on a W-2 to how do you be really good at hiring to, let's say, you know, if you're building a SaaS based tech company or a software as a service, how do you think about client success? So people are going to renew repeatedly, right? You, you can, it's one thing to do a sale and get someone on your platform, but if they don't renew after a year, well, now you're just spinning your wheels. Plus we roll in things like case studies on climate tech companies that are that are emerging today. So we ran one a few weeks ago for a company called Daily Breath. This is a company that's model using climate data to build what they feel is a more precise tool for helping people understand their asthma exposure on any given day. The more you use it, the more that you you use Daily Breath, if you were to have a flare up and you say you, you, you talk to Daily Breath on your app or through Alexa or Siri, then Daily Breath gets smarter about when you have your specific condition. It starts correlating more data to you and kind of becomes a personalized asthma warning system. So we just ran a workshop to understand, well, how did that product get started? Who built the technology behind it, which is one of the consulting companies based here called Case International. And so we're running all kinds of workshops to help give people information as they're trying to grow their companies, mentors to work with them, to help guide them in that process. And then this fall, we're launching a conference for the food and beverage industry called Food and Beverage Collider, where we're talking to big corporations, 
that have exposure to climate change and smaller companies like here in North Carolina, Counterculture Coffee, that is a kind of an artisanal coffee company, but their supply chain is global. They've got coffee growers dealing with climate change, you know, in South America. We convene these folks here because we want to help them understand what's happening with climate change. What are the trends? What's their risk? But we also want to connect them to our members who provide the solutions. And so we run these or we'll run in this case a lightning round pitch session where members who have solutions relevant to the food and beverage industry will get the stage to be able to talk about what they're doing. And that's exclusive access. The only way you get is by is by being connected to the collider. And then the last thing I would say is that, you know, we know to build companies like this realistically from Asheville, we need to bring a lot more talent to the table. And so we're building out an operational plan to do that too, starting with our first climate data hackathon that will run in October, also connected to the conference, where we're going to work with a, a food company to have that company offer up a real world challenge they're contending with, and then work with NOAA and work with Amazon to put that data up in the cloud so that people can start getting exposure to, well, how would you work with climate data to address it? And the goal is to get more university level talent, more kind of tech talent connected to the data so that we can have people over time either saying, hey, I'm going to start a company myself or I'm really interested in this emerging field. I'm going to join one of the companies that's at the Collider. And we facilitate that through internships and other vehicles as well. But it's really kind of a, a full scale effort to help build companies by building up their skills, connecting them to customers and connecting them to talent kind of everything that you need to succeed in a very challenging endeavor in an industry when you talk about climate resilience, climate adaptation, especially around the technology side, that's in its infancy and and we think is going to rapidly emerge. I'm very curious about this 10-week, uh, I guess that is the workshop, but this sort of course that people take and part of what you, you said is that you help them determine if there's like a demand for the kind of service that they want to do with this startup. And I think, you know, as you guys can appreciate, adaptation is this emerging field. It hasn't been around that long. It's things are still just kind of working themselves out on what are the tools and resources that are actually useful. And so as you kind of work with these people in that 10 week long course, is it in house expertise at the collider that is, t I mean, how do you determine that you can give them that advice? I'm just more curious about you as the collider as experts to sort of, I mean, it'd be a fascinating 10 week course independent of just like you're trying to create your own business, but I'm, you sort of have to understand the lay of the land when it comes to adaptation because they, you want to send them off into a space where they're being realistic. If that sort of makes sense, it's just, do you, is it, do you bring in guest lectures or do you have all that sort of skill set at, at the collider? Great point. No, we're, we'll bring in guest lectures. And that is, again, why we think we have an opportunity to do it from here, because, you know, we have, for example, the, the, the chief data officer for NOAA lives in Asheville. So if anybody knows big data around NOAA, it's Ed Kearns. You know, it's, it's, it's talent and expertise like that that is here in Asheville that we are going, that we are bringing in to help run this course on the climate adaptation side, on the data side. You know, a number of the things that, that companies need to do or, or would be startup founders need to do early on are less specific, let's say, to climate adaptation and resilience. If you want, if you're building a, a product you believe for an industry, well, what are some good ways to understand whether the industry wants your product? You probably need to go out and talk to people in your industry, right? And so some of what we're doing is being a forcing mechanism to say, you've got two weeks, go talk to five potential customers, figure out how to contact them or come talk to us if you need help in figuring that out and come back with some real evidence, some real answers. So you take something from the theoretical, you put it into the practical and you get you know, an, an entrepreneur into action. You know, if you're going to talk about financial modeling, there's lots of people who can help you with financial modeling. But these are not necessarily the skill sets that a scientist is who spent his his or her career doing research is going to be familiar with. And similarly, someone coming in who can code, you know, is going to have great skills, but they may they also may not know the business side of things and they may not and they certainly will have less access or understanding of 
the data side of things. And as you pointed out, Doug, too, yeah, we have a lot of companies that are connected here as members who really are leaders in adaptation, you know, whether that's an acclimatized that has their U.S. office here or a company like Statweather or Fernleaf or, or NEMAC that I alluded to. You know, we have some real firepower here in the in the adaptation space. Yeah, but I, I guess, again, going from the technical side, I mean, I could see where you could fill that I guess lesson planning relatively easy, but the sort of demand for your services. And as you said, you need to sort of go out and talk to those people. And as you know, I had Rich Sorkin from Jupiter Intel on, and they're a relatively new business. And it was just a very interesting conversation. And I I don't think they're lacking for business right now, but part of it, I just think a lot of the people that are looking for their services probably don't know exactly what they're looking for. You know, you have local governments and maybe you have insurance companies and some of them more, more sophisticated than others. And it's just, it's just, I guess what I'm getting at is that you are at this unique interface where hopefully you're assessing all that, those sort of demands and all the things that are sort of happening in the adaptation universe. And I, I can't speak for you. I don't know how good you are at that, but it, it, it's a useful interface to have because, again, people – half the battle is just, let's say, getting a local government to sort of say, we are going to take some action on adaptation planning. And then having the sophistication within your own in- employees to figure out what are the tools and resources you need and then being able to identify them in, in I guess, a useful way. And so, uh, as I said with Rich, you know, it's still sort of a, a wild, wild west situation. And I, I don't know if you necessarily feel that way at the Collider if you're – process is much more sophisticated and all makes a lot more sense but that all made sense <laughs> it totally makes sense and i and i agree with you the the we are very much trying to learn the landscape and we're pretty good at it and and we're finding it challenging just as an example you know as we're putting together this conference for the fall for the food and beverage industry when we get on the phone with some major major companies and we talk to someone who has you know, senior sustainability, supply chain and climate, let's say in their title um, for, you know, a huge food company. We get on the phone and we start talking about this conference and they start telling, talking to us about everything they're doing around mitigation, right? We're doing this to take energy out of our supply chain. We're getting rid of plastic. We're, you know, cutting our resources, energy efficiency. And we say, yeah, that is all critical. Great. Glad you're doing that. You know, let, we're talking about your risk that you face in your operations right now and as a result of a change in climate and that you're going to increasingly face because you are dependent upon inputs, right? You need water. You need your, you need soybeans. You need corn. You got to feed your livestock, whatever it may be. The person on the other phone, end of the phone that has sustainability in their title often says, yeah, we're not really focused on that. Right. And so then you have to say, well, who in your organization is? Who's thinking about climate change through the lens of adaptation and resilience? And it's very often not who we might think are the obvious people. It's not the sustainability folks necessarily. And so we are finding even ourselves that we are doing what I think is really important work to figure out who are the right contacts when you're dealing with the corporate world. Um, and it will vary from company to company. And so to your point for kind of that fledgling entrepreneur, there's varying levels, I think, of how effective they'll be in that process. We do think we can help them and, and guide them through it. But, you know, you're talking about a great point. It, this is definitely not easy work. It's an emerging industry. And I think that there are lots of people who could benefit, as you know, from thinking about adaptation and resilience who really aren't yet. So I'm not going to say that we have all the answers. We definitely don't. We do know what some of the questions are, just like you're talking about, like, hey, what do you have to figure out? And so, yeah, we're, we're going to work on doing our best to solve it and get better at it over time. Well, here's a suggestion for you. Maybe a year out from now, just as in another service that you guys offer is independent of just like someone coming in on big data or whatever, but just like how to understand how to be an adaptation professional. Cause I think of all the lessons that you would learn as you're working with these people, that would just be really helpful because it is people are just kind of winging. I winged it. I've been doing it actually for a long time and I, I winged it early on just cause there wasn't a lot of work going on. And I don't know if you guys have been involved or if you're planning to go. Um, there's a national adaptation forum. They do those every two years. And you, it's been interesting seeing how that's evolved. It used to be more natural resource focused, but now they've really, they're attracting what is an adaptation professional. Yeah, I, I highly recommend you go there and just get a sense of like, what is adaptation right now? And I think they're probably doing the best at, from a national level to kind of capture all the practitioners. Yeah, I heard you give the same advice to Rich on your podcast. So we're already, we're, <laughs> they're we're not already paying me. 
<laughs> yeah, we're definitely looking at that. I mean, it, the learning curve is huge. You know, we, we certainly don't have the answers. I, you know, I, I come from a, a kind of a startup background and an, an investor background, um, more recently. So we're certainly looking at things through the lens of startups and, and looking at, at, at saying, well, you know, if you have data and the world needs data, you know, how do you, you know, how do you package it again through the lens of kind of a tech company or a high growth consulting company? You know, what are the paths to do that? But yeah, it's absolutely in a space where it, one, it's not just data, right? Because the data's, the data's evolving, right? And the data's growing. And even that poses opportunities and challenges. So yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating space. I mean, it's just fascinating to be operating, you know, at, at this moment in this space while it's, it's really starting. Look at and, and I've only been in for three months, so I you know, will readily admit that I am I am new to it. But it feels like there's a momentum that's palpable. I agree, and I, I say this over and over again. It's just even though adaptation has probably been around 10, 15 years, it's still emerging, and you can be highly influential if you've got, if you're doing something good, and it, you know it, it's an exciting time to kind of be in the field. So I have a so a few more questions, and I want to pivot to another area, but regarding the collider and this one. The Collider is a nonprofit organization, and I'm just curious, why isn't it a for-profit like venture capital entity? Why, why is the nonprofit model? Why do you think they went that way? I mean, I guess that's before your time, but uh, I just find that very curious. The the reasoning to to approach this as a nonprofit is because of what I talked about when I talked about the kind of the numerous kinds of collisions that we're trying to create. And, and so if you expand that out, what that really means is we are thinking about how do we cultivate next generation talent, right? What does it mean to do outreach and partner with universities to think about getting more kids involved in this industry? You know, that could extend down and we've had some conversations even thinking further, you know, K through 12. How do we build, you know, generate kind of awareness and exposure of not, not necessarily the issue of climate change because we feel like there's a that is already well in hand but again thinking through you know how are we going to adapt what decisions are we going to take we're building partnerships and when you think about partnering with the government and academia you know there's the kind of the network that we're looking to create there's there's benefit to approaching that from the from the point of view of a nonprofit i mean to speak quite transparently about it as well you know we have some people who are very, you know, individuals who can who can write big checks who are very supportive of they want to be a donor. And and part of our model is dependent on donations. Grants are something we're looking at. We certainly have earned revenue. There's a there's there's actually a business case to be made for why we would be a nonprofit. Uh, at the same time, as we look to our future, we are thinking about you know, a, a complementary organization that would be for profit that would complement the work of the collider, the nonprofit and the for profit could very well end up housing a tech you know, startup tech incubator, a small fund that would support the incubator over time, maybe a bigger fund. But we did feel like a nonprofit for now, for a number of reasons, is the right way to go with the organization. OK, no, great answer. Yeah, <laughs> I need to find some of those big donors myself. You work in this big data and, and there's a lot of risk modeling going on with the, the work that uh, the, the startups that you're mentoring. And we had chatted a little bit about this. We, were, we had a phone call not too long ago. And I'm just very interested in kind of the standards that are being set out there. And as you uh, say, as they go through this process, they start their own company and they go out there and they start producing junk information. And you're not responsible for them once they've kind of started their business. But is that built into the process? I mean, is it is that are you addressing that through the scientists that kind of come in and they share oh, this is the, the real information? This is how you need to plug it in. And. Again, to go back to that conversation with Rich, is there a regulatory need to kind of monitor what's going on there, or is is that not necessary? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of all over the place with that question, but it's as a local government, let's say, works with a, a climatized, and I'm just using them. I don't, I don't know how what the reputation is, but uh, assuming it's good, and that local government might not have the skill set to understand what information they're getting. And if you're looking at 20, 30, 100 years out, you know, how do you hold people responsible when they're, we're dealing with this issue of climate change and you're really doing future projections? At, the, at this point today, I, I think 
the answer is that, and there's there's certainly is some. I, I can see where you're going with the risk involved. The, the answer is at that local city level. In fact, we were. I was just having a conversation with one of our entrepreneurs this morning about this, who's working with a city in Florida that just had a, re- a request out for proposals, and uh, you know it's un it's unclear who's ultimately going to win. But one of the companies, uh, and I and I of course won't disclose any names, but there is a company that we're looking at that that is gaining some notoriety where some of our our experts here really don't think their model's that great. I don't know what you do about that right now. I mean, they're not at this point, they're not a, they're not a member of the collider. They certainly could end up becoming one. I do think that right now it's being to the degree that it is being vetted. It's being vetted by, you know, the markets or by, by local governments who have to make that determination. We certainly want to ensure that the models that are coming out of here are as strong as possible. And, you know, even when we run these skills based workshops, like I talked about this case study of, of the company Daily Breath, and we had Marjorie McGurk from, um, from, from Case International, her consulting company, uh, talking about, okay, if we were going to, to, to put, to build this model and build the algorithms that can inform, you know, asthma, we had to do a, you know, a full, um, you know, all this background research on what the literature says. And they talked, she talked about how they started with 300 journals and, and all the articles they went through to parse, you know, even to parse the science to understand whether there were algorithms to be built, whether it was, whether, you know, they would have something valid to actually bring to market. And certainly I think that comprehensive approach is something that that I want to understand better and I want to have our team understand better as we're working with more and more startups to make sure that we are helping advise companies in the best ways possible. I don't have a great answer yet. I agree with you. It may be the wild, wild west at this point. I'm not sure how that all unfolds. I think the best that we can do right now is connect our entrepreneurs to, you know, what I would consider world class resources and, and experts who happen to be here in Asheville and have spun up here in Asheville as a result of Noah's presence as this climate cluster here in Asheville continues to grow. And then as we reach out beyond it to experts, you know, all over the world. But I would clearly, uh, and to a certain extent, I'm not trying to dance around your question, but I don't really have the, the precise answer for you. Yeah, I think I'm trying to make you the policeman. And you know, you put it, you framed it in a way I didn't even think about, let's say, an existing company. That's already doing this work, but that wants to become a member and, like you said, might not have a great reputation. Are is the collider prepared not to accept them as a member? And I don't even necessarily want to put you on the spot, but I mean, probably these are things you're going to have to think about. You know, as people start really getting to this space and actually doing work, and then the response to that work. Yeah, what what is a a member in good standing kind of thing? Yeah, over time, you may be right. You absolutely may be right. I mean, that and and that. May end up being something that that we take a look at. It's it's hard for me to to project out. But on the one hand, if you said, "Hey, do you have a you know sort of a a, a science advisory committee or, or those things?" They could be built in, and they could be built in. I think also depending on, like, let's say for example, you know, when we launch our incubator on the for profit side, you know, there there certainly will be more diligence going into you know to that side. I mean, just by the nature of as, if there's investment dollars flowing there, whatever, like those early folks are going to take a pretty hard look at the science and you want experts to be able to validate models. I don't know if we can, uh, I'm, I'm just not sure how it unfolds, but I think you're raising something that for sure we and others will be taking a look at it as, especially if, if we are succeeding, right? Especially if we are actually, you know, there is this flourishing of a thousand applications, right? There's like a thousand tech companies emerging and this whole field evolves how and unfolds how, you know, in our minds and our vision, we really want and expect it to and hope to play a, a leading role in. Then yes, all of these things are going to come up and, and are, are going to have to be dealt with. In a way, opportunity for a higher profile. And I'm just trying to think of an example where you set kind of like an international or national standard within an industry and people kind of adhere to those standards and not in the adaptation space. Not many people are doing that. And there's a group, uh, ASAP, the Society for Adaptation Professionals. And, you know, they're talking about a certification program for members and, a, and is there a need for certification? And I come on both sides of that. I, I do think in some ways, I think as a legitimate kind of field, you, you sort of need to start thinking like that. But at the same time, it's so many different sectors. But like the Collider, maybe through a science advisory group, setting some standards. And, and I think probably the federal government would be very interested in 
that too. I'm not sure right now what's happening with the federal government, but eventually they'll probably get back to like trying to establish some of these climate standards that they want to publicly share. So anyway, uh, just I think roles for different groups to helping establish more useful information. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. All right, I'm going to do a huge pivot here, and I want to dig into your history a bit more, and I think my listeners would find this very interesting, and they probably, maybe they recognize your voice. I think you you were a TV personality for a while, and the, this concept, and catch me up on it, but you created the Lazy Environmentalist, and please tell me about that, you know, sort of like the history of that, and then what you sort of did with that, and I don't think you're currently involved with that, are you? I mean, what's going on with that? <laughs> The the lazy environmentalist was in in an accidental brand I would say that came out of a a a sustainable furniture company I'd started back in 2003 called Vivavi like Viva V Live Life and I had actually dropped out of a PhD program in political science where I was focusing on China and the environment and politics which was just way too highfalutin for me and I thought you know what I my my personal mission in life is going to be to help consumers go green. Uh, I think I could be really good at that as a consumer myself. I think I know a fair amount about that and so I I kind of eventually latched on to the idea of of modern sustainable furniture that would be really beautiful and people wouldn't have to sacrifice aesthetic to go green and built this little company. My my first employee in that company which I started in Washington, D.C. I'd actually got into a PhD program at GW that I then left after not quite a year. She was with me for about a year and a half. It was an e-commerce company. We were working out of my apartment, and eventually I moved up to, to, to Brooklyn to get around some of my furniture designers. Well, on our last day working together, because she decided that she wasn't going to make that move, she was staying in D.C., I am a fairly lazy guy, Doug, and so we made a deal that if she would pack up my apartment, pack up my office, load up this van that we had that we would take to you know different product shows, um, and drive with me up to Brooklyn and unpack it, I'd give her the van as like a parting goodbye. Nice. And so, yeah, it was pretty. I thought it was a pretty good deal, and I guess she did too. So it was a it was a you know a long day, and then 10 o'clock at night, we're on the New Jersey Turnpike driving up to Brooklyn. And Lucy, st- I could tell she's starting to get really nervous and, you know, she's in the passenger seat and she's like, so, or something's wrong. Like she's hyper, she's like kind of hyperventilating, you know, like, <gasps> and I'm like, Lucy, are you okay? And she says, finally, she says, look, Josh, I have to ask you something. I have to get this off my chest. I couldn't ask you when you were my boss, but you know, after today, you're not my boss anymore. And there's something I really need to know. And so I immediately thought, Oh my God, she's attracted to me. This is crazy. <laughs> that ego going, of yours. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, like instant day, right? Like I'm going to this new apartment in Brooklyn. I've never been there. I'm subletting a room. There's a roommate. How's this night going to go? Ah, you know, I start freaking out. And so I calm myself down. I was like, no, it's okay. Like we can talk about it. You can ask me anything you want. And so she was like, okay. And finally she was like, look, are you really an environmentalist? And so not at all attracted to me, actually, like and turn, she was actually infuriated with me. She's like, you're always in the shower, like you barely recycle. You were going to throw your bed out. I took it to the homeless shelter. Like you don't act like an environmentalist, like basically like you're an awful person. And so <laughs> everything she was saying was true. And so uh, about a week later after she, you know, slept on the couch that night, took my van back to D.C. and I was processing. I wrote a blog entry. Uh, so this was like early 2005, I want to say, called The Lazy Environmentalist about myself. And I was saying, look, I care about the planet. I really want to do my best to protect it, but I take long showers because I do my best thinking in the shower. And I know I'm using energy and water and I don't want to, you know, a Toyota Prius, even though now – like current time, I actually, my wife and I, so both have them, but at the time it was like, I want an Audi, Audi TT convertible. And so the, my point was like, you industry make this cool, affordable, easy, attractive to me to go green and I will do it. And then what happened and transpired after that was an, uh, an internet radio producer called me up and said, Hey, let's turn this into a radio show. I said, great. I didn't have a big marketing budget for my furniture company. I said, I'd love to host a radio show. And so we started doing this little online radio show where I, soundproofed my closet in my Brooklyn apartment and would broadcast to the world from there and guests would call in and I would call in and we'd do this little interview. Six months later, it ended up going to Sirius Satellite Radio by, you know, fortunately having been in New York where Sirius was at the time, um, wrote a couple of books, went on the Martha Stewart show for Earth Day in 2007. 
it was awesome. And that caught the attention of Sundance Channel. And yeah, we ended up turning this concept of the lazy environmentalist where I would help, you know, regular everyday Americans figure out how they could go green without trying very hard. We turned that into a reality TV show that I had on Sundance Channel for uh, a couple of years. Um, and it was a, you know, an amazing run, great timing to be doing that around like 2006, seven, eight, you know, nine. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and it, it definitely resonated. The, what ended up happening, just so you know, my journey in 2010, we did our second season of the show. We didn't get renewed for a third. So I decided to go back into the startup world and moved out to San Francisco to run marketing for a startup called Good Guide, which was an early B corporation or benefit corporation thinking about how to do good in the world and do good for their, their stakeholders. I then got recruited to go back to New York for a company that Amazon had just bought, best known as diapers.com, to launch an e-commerce business called vine.com, which was like an online Whole Foods, and I built that for a couple of years. And when I came down to Asheville five years ago, I ended up joining the city's effort to, it was a public-private partnership we call Venture Asheville to build Asheville's high-growth entrepreneurship ecosystem and launched our angel investor group called Asheville Angels. And we've you know, made 20 investments in a lot of sustainable companies, actually. So kind of the, the lens of like building startups, entrepreneurial ecosystem building, which is what we're doing at the Collider, understanding the, the investment landscape. I fortunately had those experiences, which um, bringing to the Collider as we roll out this strategy. Wow. What a journey. <laughs> well, first off, just observations of how you, you misread the, 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 your, your coworker. I, I'm still doing that with my wife and men are clueless. I just, <laughs> it all comes down. Oh, she must be interested. Absolutely nothing to do with that. Yeah. That must have been just a great adventure for you. And to me, and I want to pivot back to adaptation here, but I, I thought it would be very interesting to sort of hear that story. The lazy environmentalist, and I, and I sort of thought I had a sense of what it was. It's like, you want to do well, but at the same time, you know, it can't kill you. Like my wife will bend over backwards with everything regarding environmental. And, and I do a podcast on environmental and I'm not nearly as good as she is. I'm cl closer to your area. And so I wonder because environmentalist and adapter, and you've heard me probably say adapter on the podcast before, and they're not necessarily the same thing. If you're involved with adaptation, it doesn't necessarily mean you're an environmentalist. And I'm just wondering your sort of professional opinion. Do you think there's a need for like the lazy adapter? Well, I think there's a, there are lines to be drawn between adapting and and the concept of sort of lazy environmentalism. And what I think is really interesting about talking to you know various constituents about climate adaptation. Um, well let me give you a little background. When I was doing the lazy environmentalist, I ended up being the I was the national spokesperson for Brita, you know, the water pitcher company. Yeah. yeah. They, then they had a campaign to use Brita pitchers and not use disposable water bottles and reduce your, your waste and your impact. And so I would do a lot of uh, media work for them. And I would go on like radio in Knoxville, Tennessee. And, you know, I, I'd be on the phone or I'd be on my phone waiting to go on the show and I could hear the, you know, the two morning DJs talking about like in the commercial break, oh man, we got this like, Yankee environmentalist coming on, you know, like he's, you know, and like, blah, this is going to suck. And, and then like, but I can hear this whole thing. Right. And then I come on and they're like, okay, Josh Dorfman, lazy environmentalist, Josh, you're not here to make us feel bad. Are you? And, and what I would end up doing because I love college football, I would just talk about college football, right? I'd be like, Oh, UT, like your team, you got, you know, Eric ball, whoever it was at the time, like, you know, we'd have this like college football conversation. Then they'd be like, Okay, you're like a normal guy. Like, fine, like, tell us about the environment, you know? And then, like, I tell them about the, what I was there to talk about. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I get that. Okay, that's, that's, that's cool. Thanks, Josh. And, and it would work out. And what I feel like with climate adaptation, you know, this is not a very contentious topic, right? If you're talking about climate adaptation, you're saying, look, the climate is changing, right? It is getting warmer. That is sort of, that is undisputed fact. And if it's getting warmer, whether you like it or not, or whatever side of the political fence you're on about that, or whatever your views on or what's causing it, it really doesn't matter if your ability to grow crops is diminishing or changing, right? Or if like there's, you're experiencing the impacts of a changing climate, we should probably do something about that. And so I think, and, and that resonates because it just removes all of the other, you know, 
flash topics, hot buttons, all the issues around climate change says we got to get to work, guys, so we can adapt and thrive and continue to live well. I think it has, like the lazy environmentalist, a very practical component to it. So I don't think it's lazy adaptation. I think it's just really saying like, hey, like this is really in like our financial, economic, human, psychological self-interest to deal with this right now. And I haven't fully tested it yet, though, Doug, so I'm hopeful about <laughs> that. But, but at least it resonates with my folks, right? Or my dad, who like doesn't always understand exactly everything I'm talking about. So, um, and some of his friends. So I feel like there's, you know, there's a, a, a small sample size that is like, okay, yeah, I get that. Like, that makes sense. Keep up the good work. Yeah, a good point there. And I look at this podcast as sort of an experiment on the psychology of adaptation. And I agree that the dynamic and, the attitude is just much different. And I'm glad I don't focus on the mitigation side because there's a lot of sort of like, oh, you got to do this and sacrifice this, whereas adaptations is kind of proactive. Let's let's get our hands dirty and do something about it. You know, and I've, I, I even had a skeptic contact me who said he really liked hearing the stories around adaptation. It, he couldn't he wasn't dwelling on the sort of saying, OK, we have to do all this to address climate change, which we do. I don't want to give the uh, other impression, but I just the idea of true mitigation through adaptation. I'm hopeful uh, there's a pathway there. Just people kind of get their heads around adaptation. It's a and maybe you and I can collaborate. We can come up with like the hopeful adapter, you know, like uh, I like that. <laughs> yes, I like that. A, a flip on your lazy environmentalist. I got a couple more questions for you. This has been a fantastic conversation, and I want to sort of pivot back uh, to adaptation more directly in, I guess, the work that you're doing. And is, is you, I guess, you're new to your position, but as you sort of interact with folks in, in the adaptation universe, what, I, I don't know if you, you got to listen to – I did this California Adapt series. It was a three-part series, and UCLA sponsored it. And the head of the Institute of Environment there, Peter Kariva, we interviewed him, and I thought he had something really interesting to say. And he was saying why we're not making a lot of traction on the adaptation side, which I, I think we're making a lot more. But part of his, his reasoning was like there's just no money to be made, whereas on the mitigation side, you know, there, there, there's renewable energy and there's all sorts of big money that's kind of flowing into that. But they're not quite sure how money's flowing into adaptation. And I was just curious your thoughts. If do you agree with that? And in, I think your whole existence is based on the notion of like there's money to be made in adaptation. Yeah, I agree that there is money to be made in adaptation. I also agree that, yeah, right now, for sure, if you're looking at renewable energy or, or some other technologies, yeah, those are giant markets. But my feeling is, and, and our kind of thesis here, is that Here's something that we're looking at just by, as by, by way of sort of illustration. We, someone, someone here was talking about yesterday an article they read where the, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you said to someone, what's the symbol of climate change? Right. The symbol was like a polar bear, right? That was like what, how people thought about climate change. Today, when people think about climate change, they don't think about polar bears. They think about severe weather. They think about these crazy storms. Which means that the, the way people are thinking about climate change is shifting from something that's like, ah, this just affects like a bear thousands of miles away at like some like North Pole or wherever polar bears are. It doesn't really affect me, but I should care because out of my like goodness of my like bleeding heart and ethics and morality. But now it's no, this weather is getting really weird and more severe and that is starting to personally impact me and people I know, we need to do something about that. And that also means that it's going to start personally impacting or professionally impacting businesses that will be disrupted. And where there's business disruption, you know, and there's risk and there's therefore money to lose, that also means that people who have solutions have money to make. That's pretty much how we see it. Or again, with public health or just health issues. Yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done around public health. But if you can personalize health, like when I talked about our company here, Daily Breath, and if you have a mom who's got a kid with asthma and you can say to that mom, I can give you some higher level of comfort with some greater probability of, you know, for more effectively taking care of your child. Yeah, that demand, you know, is pretty high. And so, you know, you have to find the models that work, of course, the business models, I mean, but we do believe that this is a, since the, it, you know, it's a weird thing, because like the climate, you can say, well, the climate impacts everything. And it's like, okay, 
But how do I break that down? Like, what does that actually mean? But if it's influencing like where FedEx and UPS are going to land their planes or fly their planes from because some runways are getting too hot and so some planes may or may not be able to take off, you know, on the, on the schedule they want, like there's money there in helping UPS and FedEx find, find that out. We're just learning about all the opportunities right now, but we definitely think there's money to be made, a lot of money to be made in helping business and society, you know, not just adapt to, to climate change, but really figure out like, how do we continue to thrive? Like, how do we continue our way of life? And as the, you know, the symbol of climate change is increasingly severe weather, billion dollar plus storms, things that didn't happen in the past, you know, that the, the resonance is much greater than when it was polar bears, right? It's just, it's more, it's on, a, it's starting to affect humans. And when it affects humans, then humans are going to need to figure out very quickly what to do do about it. And that probably means paying for people who've come up with some really good ideas and some great solutions. I know you work with startups and that's sort of your core business, but just for my average listener, what would you recommend if they wanted to engage more with the Collider? Uh, for starters, I would say go to our website, the, the collider.org, get on our newsletter. We, we put out a monthly newsletter. We call it Climate City Insider, which is talking about uh, events that are, you know, a lot of events that are happening here. We live stream a lot of our events. And also, Doug, just to come back, like, wh why are we a nonprofit? Well, we put on all sorts of speaker series as well and things that do relate to more broadly to, to awareness and education around the topics. We want, we run a lot of stuff from here. We also highlight other things that are going on around the country that are of interest. Soon, over the next few months, we're launching an industry newsletter called Climate Data Space, which will be an industry lens, again, through the lens of entrepreneurship, of what's happening globally that's going to be of interest to, to climate entrepreneurs, whether that's conferences, opportunities to speak, funding opportunities, you know, startups that are hiring or companies that are growing. We're going to cover the, the industry from that lens. And so, you know, getting on the climate data space newsletter for the kind of the coming soon for it, that's a great way for people interested in adaptation who want to find their opportunity, but who may not find their travels taking them to Asheville to really get dialed in and connected to, to ways that can help them in their own careers. Okay, so this might be annoying, but it, it seems like you're creating, you're trying to create such a, I guess, friendly atmosphere. If someone, like an adaptation professional, is traveling through Asheville, is your facility the kind of place where you do the drop in, or maybe they email in advance, but just to kind of learn more about what you do, or I mean, or do you not want to encourage that? You want it to sort of. Yes, we encourage it. Okay. So okay. <laughs> we, we absolutely encourage it. I mean, we have, if someone's, if there's a professional coming through, wants a place to work for a day, we certainly have, you know, the availability for people to here, to, uh, to work on a daily basis. It is a stunning space, awesome views, beautiful co-working, kitchen facilities, conference rooms, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. And we certainly want, uh, professionals who are, who, who may be in Nashville to, to drop in. We want to meet you. Like I said, I mean, you know, we're building what we hope is a global hub and, and a global network for climate adaptation. But that starts with human connections. And we very much feel that, that we want to create that welcoming environment. Where people feel like they want to be connected to us. And, um, and if we can be supportive in some way, that's mutually beneficial. And we, we do that all day long. I mean, that's really what our team is here to do. Great. And so I was, when I was looking at your website, it talked about the services for members and such. And it talked, it said latest podcast audio equipment. So are people podcasting there? And I, I think Leia Quintal, is that how you pronounce your last name? Leia Quintal? Quintal, yeah. Quintal. We, we chatted a little briefly. I, I think I was encouraging you guys to start your own podcast. And I think one of the side things I said is, at the Climate Collider, and that would just be a killer name for a podcast. But so, is anyone podcasting there right now? Well, we we set the room up. We have a room that we soundproofed as the podcast room. We are in the early stages of of planning a a, a Collider podcast and just mapping out what what that might look like. We and it is a we don't have anyone yet, but it is a member perk. And so if we do have other m members who want to start their own podcast, yeah, we did invest in some some pretty nice equipment, and it, and it is a perk of being a member here. All right, great, and you're not everyone does that. All right, final question I ask all my guests: If you could re recommend one guest to come on to this podcast, who would it be? Jeff Hicks. 
who is whose company is called Fernleaf Interactive, who just launched a product called Excel Adapt. And this product is being piloted by uh, West Palm Beach at the moment. It is a, a tool. I think I may have mentioned this earlier in our conversation, Doug, but it, it, this is a, a software as a service tool that will enable cities to uh, to have a, an updated ongoing lens, you know, if, if their city floods or there's water coming to city, sea level rise, severe weather, where that water is going to flow. And also, if you put a new building in the ground or a real estate developer who has a big project they want to put in the ground, can quickly model how would that influence where water would then flow, right? So because there's two dynamics to see. It's not just – it's not a static environment where all you need to know is like, okay, sea level's rising, so where's the water going to go? If you're changing your urban landscape, you need to understand how those changes impact uh, things like water flow um, so you can do your planning and resilience planning accordingly. He's – I believe really at the forefront of moving this, you know, climate tech adaptation forward. And he's also connected to NEMAC, the UNC Asheville Center of Excellence here around climate studies. They do a lot together. In fact, he was, he was born out of NEMAC. Uh, and so they work on a lot together. And I think he has just a wonderful lens on what local cities and city governments are are doing now and tools available to them to, to focus on climate adaptation. Awesome. And I assume you could make introductions if needed. I'd be happy to. All right. Great. All right. That was a fantastic conversation. Uh, I learned a ton. I think what you guys do, it, it's just very exciting. And I think, again, it's just sort of the evolution of the adaptation universe, a, a group like yours is forming. But uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Doug, thank you so much for having me on. I, I enjoyed my conversation and I am a great fan of the work that you are doing, the messages that you are spreading and the platform that you are giving to some amazing, amazing professionals who are who are focused on this field. So I wish you continued success as well. And I hope we talk again soon. All right. Great. Thank you so much. OK, adapters, that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thanks to Josh Dorfman for coming on the podcast. Great guy, and I'll be really curious to see how the Collider evolves. There is so much open space for innovative ideas in the adaptation universe, and the Collider is stepping it up. Some final housekeeping, don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but search for America Daps on Facebook and ask to join, and I'll approve you right away. It's a chance to hear some insider info on the podcast and see what other listeners are sharing on the wall. Some great conversations have really come out of that group. And I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. Tell me about your favorite episode. Tell me what you do. What is your role in the adaptation universe? Or if you're interested in starting a role, it's the highlight of my week hearing from you. And sometimes it actually leads to some cool collaborations. I am at americadaps at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, check out the website at americadaps.org. All this information is in my show notes, especially the link to that donate page. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.